Hello everyone, and thank you for tuning in. As we celebrate this festive season, we bring you a special episode where people share their creepiest and most unnerving stories. Join us as we explore these chilling tales, and don't forget to subscribe. Wishing you all a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. When I was nine years old, my grandfather was in the hospital. He was suffering from bone cancer and diabetes. As his health declined, my visits with him became more and more limited. Until there came a day when I was told I was no longer allowed to see him. To this day, I still don't know the reasoning behind this, but I was my grandfather's favorite person in the world and vice versa, and I have my theories that my family didn't want me to remember him in this way. My grandfather was my best friend, and his being in the hospital confused me. I knew he was sick, but I did not grasp the extent of his sickness until one day, when I was playing at my mother's friend's home and the rest of my family was at the hospital with my grandfather. I remember stopping whatever I was doing at the time because I was overcome with a very strange feeling. I got up and slowly walked into the kitchen, where my mother's friend was preparing our snack. She looked at me in a very peculiar manner and asked me what was wrong, but I could not look at her. The only thing I could focus on was the phone hanging on the wall, and then, in a voice almost not even my own, I heard myself say, that phone is going to ring, and the person on the other end is going to tell you my grandpa just died. I stood there for a couple seconds and then turned to walk outside through an open door to my left. As I was exiting the house, I heard several sharp rings from a telephone. I walked to the swing set in the yard and started swinging alone, slowly. After a couple minutes, I looked up and saw my mother's friend, in tears, staring at me from just inside the doorway with a look of horror on her face, and all I did was smile at her. I've always been really close with my mom's side of the family, and my uncle in particular. My grandma recently had to move out of her house for a stay in the hospital for complications, and we all flew in to clean up her house so she could move back in. The house was a wreck, my grandparents hadn't been capable of cleaning it for years. We found Tabasco sauce from 1972. Among the clutter was a very old, think the turn of the 20th century, framed picture of a little girl dressed in very proper clothes for the time period. The front of the glass frame was shattered like something smashed it. I asked who it was, and my uncle said it was there when my grandmother bought the house. Throughout the years, I'd heard my mom's family mention the Quaker. As a kid, I always pictured the guy on the oatmeal boxes, but now that my brothers and I had grown up, my uncle told us what they'd meant the whole time. A couple hundred years ago, whenever the Quakers were around, the Quakers had a community in the area, and this house was one of the first they built. The picture was found in the attic one day, as my grandmother was starting to show signs of mental illness, when my uncle was about 18. My grandma thought the picture was nice, and she put it up at the top of the stairs, she was a bit crazy. Well, as soon as the picture went up, SHT started going down. My uncle came home one night, and all the lights were turned on. While he was in the shower, every light in the house went out at once. He looked outside and saw it wasn't a neighborhood power outage, so he went to see what happened. The lights hadn't gone out. All the lights had been flicked off simultaneously. He lost his SHT and ran out of the house, slept at a friend's, and waited for my grandma to come back from her job in the morning. My uncle was the youngest, so all the other kids had left the house. Nobody could corroborate his stories until one day his brother visited the house. They were in the living room when they heard something smash. They ran and saw that the picture of the baby girl had been smashed at the foot of the stairs. The thing was, they had not heard the picture loudly fall down the stairs. It was at the top of the stairs, and now it was at the bottom, but it had not touched any of the stairs on the way down. Not only that, but it was broken in the center, as if it had been punched. My mom's whole family is university educated and atheist. My uncle is a university professor who thinks religion is bullshit and is the least spiritual person you will ever meet, but his entire family swears that the ghost of a Quaker is in that house. My aunt, who now takes care of my grandma, hears footsteps running around the house sometimes, my grandma can barely walk let alone run. Sometimes the steps come right towards her, and then she can hear the ghost run right around her and into the walls. I had to stay in this house for a weekend, sleeping on the floor and cleaning out the attic. I never saw anything, but it still freaked me the fuck out, and I truly do believe my family's stories. My senior year of college, I worked in a group home for mentally challenged adults. One of these boys was severely autistic and would rarely talk. We'll call him Barry. One evening, around 10.45 p.m., I was waiting for my replacement to come in. As I suspected that all of the men were asleep, I was surprised to hear talking coming from the den. As I peered into the den, I saw Barry sitting on the couch talking, and I assumed he was talking to himself. 
I approached him and asked who he was talking to, and he replied, the man who lived here before. It was a little weird, but I thought nothing of it. I documented it in the log book, as it was on very rare occasions that Barry would talk. My replacement came for the night, and I went home. The next day, I received a call from a fellow employee who told me the story of how, before the house was a group home, a woman had killed her husband there. I tried to call his bluff, but upon googling it, I found that it had happened approximately two years before that day. It totally creeped me out. I graduated soon after and kept in touch with some of the people who worked in that house. I learned that multiple people quit within the next couple of months. One kid who I was friendly with told me he quit because he spent a night on the overnight shift with the feeling that there was something directly in front of his face that he couldn't see or touch. Another girl quit because one of the mentally challenged men who lived in the house told her that he doesn't like it when there are other people watching him in the basement, when he had been down there alone the whole time. It was just creepy stuff. One of the creepiest stories I've ever read, courtesy of some guy named Black Fedora, P.T. Having spent my life in a buzzing metropolis, driving through the Midwest states was a hypnotic and sobering experience. Anyone who has seen the breadbasket of America will know what I'm talking about. Fields. Billions of acres of crops covered the land in waves of undulating leaves. The tamed wilderness was organized into rows, blocks, and circles, continuing on for hours and hours and days and days. That's one of the strangest things about driving through the Midwest. The endless ocean of cornfields, birthed by man's labors, seems to go on without end, but with no signs of those who created it. A car here, a small house there, a windmill, a rotting barn, it's as if some great civilization built it eons ago and then died out, leaving the living remains of their creations for you to drive past and wonder at. That's how I found myself on the evening of the last day in July, driving my red sedan along a veritable tunnel of a road cut across the cornfields. No broad highway for me, rather, I had chosen a gravel detour that I had been promised led back to the interstate. The last few exhausting days had seen me driving non-stop across the country, but today, as the sun peaked in the sky and began its free fall back into the earth, the end of my trip drew near. Rest, relaxation, and, who the fuck knows, maybe even fun lay at my feet, the only thing separating me from my goal was a mile more of gravel road and a few insignificant minutes on the freeway. Unfortunately, my car was having a little trouble navigating the tiny country road. The assholes at the gas station had promised a worn but perfectly passable route, but a few miles in, it became increasingly evident that neither description fit this sorry excuse for a road. Still, the anxiety didn't really sink in until the gravel path degenerated into a dusty path and then into mere ruts on the ground. As the weeds growing between the tire tracks began to hit the underside of my car, I briefly grappled with the idea of turning around and taking the more traditional, albeit longer, paved route. But soon, that bitch, stubbornness, got her way, and I plowed on forward against the rising weeds and deepening darkness. As the sun kissed its lower lip to the crust of the earth, I stopped the car. My journey had come to an abrupt halt. The road, barely discernible among the vegetation and barely wide enough for the car, had ended. Stopped. Right in the middle of a field of corn. Apparently, this was the literal road to nowhere. I cursed the hicks back at the pump and save who had given me these shit directions and considered my options. Option, actually. The only action now was to return down the path I had so painfully traveled and then take the long, paved road all the way around. Holding my breath, I tried to stifle a headache and several curse words running through my brain. And that's when I heard that sweet sound. Pr 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 prub is the unmistakable mating cry of a Harley tearing down a highway at full speed. Evidently, the interstate was straight ahead and only a few hundred yards away. I felt some guilt for what I was planning, but stubbornness sisters, adventure and lethargy, convinced me that mowing down several hundred feet of some farmer's corn harvest was worth not spending hours more on the road. I wasn't sure if a sedan could hold up to such punishment, but my car handled it like a pro, crushing and pulverizing the green stalks as they bent away and under the bumper. A couple minutes, and bam! I was through, back out into the dim evening light. I laughed and flipped the wipers to clean up all the green shrapnel covering my windshield. I stopped mid-laugh. This was a road, but definitely not the highway. A two-lane, paved, black road ran in a perfectly straight line off into the distance, disappearing into the evening light. I cursed the assholes at the gas station again and prepared to bash my way back to the dirt path. But turning around, the beautiful hole I punched through the field was gone. A wall of corn, not row to row, but stalk to stalk, stood in front of me, and I realized with a sinking heart that there was no way I could find the dirt path again in that solid block of green. Once again, I weighed my options. There are just two options now, left or right. 
I headed what I figured was due south and hoped this road linked up to the highway I so desperately strove for. Miles and miles I traveled. There was no change in scenery. Miles and miles of cornfields, pressing in on the car, enveloped me in the gloom of early night. No other cars. No other sounds. There was no radio reception. I stopped a few times, at first listening for the signs of a busy highway and later just listening for anything at all, anything beyond my own breathing. Nothing. Nothing but the crickets, gently chirping to each other across the ocean of waving stalks. More driving. The crickets faded away, and only the occasional shrill whine of a cicada cried out into the night. More driving. Low on gas. More driving. The moon peers over the tufts of corn and lifts itself into the sky, transforming the land into monochrome and draining away color. More driving. Very fucking low on gas. More driving. Nothing but corn corn is fucking everywhere. More driving. A barn? A barn. A glow from the light of the moon, it appears like a ship in the sea, a dark but welcome shape rising above the monotonous and oppressive landscape. With a mixture of relief and apprehension, I continue down the road. One turn, a short driveway, and I'm there, parking at the bottom of the sloping hill that leads up to its moonlight roof. It's built in an old wooden style, high gabled with heavy oak doors. It looks old. Like, not just normal oh look, it's an old barn kids old, but really old, like it hasn't been looked upon, much less opened, in hundreds of years. Still, its presence offers hope, companionship, shelter, and safety. Getting out of the car, I walk up the path to the front doors. Interestingly, the grass all around the barn, a meadow extending about 50 yards, is clearly meticulously cut and groomed. Also, the path up to the barn has been worn smooth, like some large machine has routinely pounded up and down, polishing and flattening the path. Striding up to the door, I knock. And knock again. I give it several minutes, but apparently no one is living inside. I open the doors and walk in. I was right. Now, this is true, and this happened to me. I never really put much stock in the concept of ghosts or the supernatural in general. My mother is an alcoholic and a self-described psychic, so it was pretty easy to take my personal experience with her and apply it to the whole spectrum. I'd roll my eyes so violently at the mere mention of spirits that you'd think they were about to roll out of my head. About 10 years ago, my friend and I were walking through this park on the way back to his house. It was a shortcut, which made it appealing when you had to be home at a certain time, and along the water, which made it rather scenic. We fancied ourselves teenage philosophers, and we would generally have these long-winded conversations about how we were going to change the world, for what it's worth, we didn't even notice when it changed us. For the purposes of illustration, I need to describe the park. It was a long, curving path off a larger one, the Galloping Goose Trail, that circled a small inlet of water along the gorge. Walking up the hill, the lights at the side of the trail stopped just before you got into the woods proper, and there was one last one along the hill that stood like a beacon, a lighthouse. Beyond that, the path continued through a wooded area, crested a hill, and went down again. At one point in the path, you could see this broken down house peering through the trees, but that was about it, you were never actually all that far away from houses and stores, it just felt like you were. When the sun went down, the park was rather foreboding and incredibly dark. As we were walking up, we did this all the time, the last light along the trail flickered and died. I found this odd, but not especially noteworthy. It certainly didn't come up in conversation. We walked into the dark, and we were coming down the hill on the other side when there was this noise. It was impossibly loud, and it had movement to it. Now, I don't know about any of you, but in my position, my rational mind immediately leapt to explain the noise. I discerned it was a helicopter, at first, merely flying low to the ground. But as it got closer and the sound could be heard with more clarity, my heart sank. And then it was all around us, a thunderous roar. I looked up, and the trees were still silhouetted against the evening sky. I heard voices. Not ten, but hundreds, thousands. It was a single, distorted sound consisting of speaking, whispering, and screaming. I couldn't make out individual words, but I know what I heard. And it was awful. The sound faded and continued away from us. We looked at each other, we didn't say a word, and we turned on our heels and walked back. We weren't running, but there was an undeniable briskness to our pace. When we got back to the main road, I lost my shit. I couldn't explain it, and it terrified me because I couldn't punch it in the face. I realize how foolish that must sound, but that feeling of utter helplessness was horrible. I asked him if he heard it, and he just nodded his head. We looked into it and figured we'd be big bloody detectives, make ourselves feel better, or something. It turns out that the only real calamity our little town ever had was a bridge collapse. 
and the bodies were dragged up on the shores we were walking through that night. The house that I mentioned, the one that stood alone, foreboding and derelict in a row of otherwise normal houses, we checked it out, and the feeling of dread I got from that place was enough to make our visit brief. There was a shitload of lumber there, just sitting there in piles, rotting. We found out that there had been an abandoned renovation attempt through the city archives, but any history on the house itself was really hard to come by. We found out later that it wasn't where it was originally built, it was originally built on the other side of town. There was a fire listed in the records, and then it was moved. I don't know why, but I stayed the fuck out of that park afterwards. Mostly. I was out with my girlfriend a few months later. The initial shock of the incident had worn off, and I was telling her with all the gusto and enthusiasm of an uncle at a campfire when we started making that trek up the hill. I told her we'd be okay. I still don't know why I said this. I said we'd be okay so long as the light didn't burn out. As if on cue, it did. She started tugging at my arm in the opposite direction and declared that we were leaving. I stood there slack-jawed and just looked at the light. And then, I started seeing things. Tricks of the light, maybe. I looked down, and the shadows. The shadows of the trees seemed to be circling around us. I'd never seen anything like that before or since. I never went back into that park after dark. This actually happened in my city. Every time a family would leave their house and come home, they would find that there was a plate, a drinking glass, or some other object sitting out. The family could have sworn that they cleaned their stuff up, but they figured they must have been forgetting to clean some stuff up before they would leave. They noticed this happening every once in a while for a couple of months, until one day they pulled into their driveway and saw smoke coming from their garage. As they opened their garage door, they saw a man inside setting their house on fire. They quickly closed the door and ran for help from their neighbor while calling the police. The police finally came, and they caught the guy and discovered that the man had been living in their house for months in their attic and sneaking down to eat when the family would leave. He had all of their information and was planning on killing them and running off with all of their information. Another related story, although it did not happen in my city. Every morning for weeks, a little boy would tell his father during breakfast that he had seen a clown staring at him in his room the night before. The man would constantly take his son up to his room to show him that there was nothing there. After another couple of nights, the boy stopped seeing the clown at night. About a week later, the father was watching the evening news, and he saw that a man had been arrested for living in people's attics, dressing up as a clown, and staring at the families before moving on to the next house. Last summer, 2009, I worked at a laser tag place in Ocean City, Maryland. My friend and I both worked there, and we would sometimes get to work early and hang out out back. Behind the store is a four-story apartment building that, being the height of the summer, was full of happy vacationers. It's the kind of building where the hallways and stairs to the different suites are out in the open, rather than inside, with a railing keeping you from falling off. Me and Steve got to work early and played some arcade games before our shift. We won some tickets and redeemed them for little balls. We retreated out back, where we tossed them back and forth, smoked cigarettes, and talked about how school was going. This was the summer between our freshman and sophomore years of college. Life was finally kicking into gear. Behind us, some kids were playing on the walkways of the apartment building. Tag, or something. One of them wasn't interested in the game, instead, he was leaning out over the railing on the top floor, probably spitting or dropping rocks or something. I remember thinking to myself, oh wow, that kid is going to fall. I told Steve, and he pegged me with the ball. Dude, you know that shit freaks me out. Shut up. He picked up the ball to play some more, but I couldn't shake the image of the kid falling from my head. I sat down on a parking block, or whatever you call them, and watched the kids play. Steve was going on about something, probably about me scaring him. He stole my attention just long enough for us both to hear a scream. Followed by the worst sound I will ever hear. I jumped the wooden fence that separated the parking lots of the store and the apartments and pushed my way through the bushes to find the kid, face first in a rapidly expanding puddle of blood. The fucker had fallen four stories onto a parking lot and landed face first. Steve was still pushing through the bushes, his reaction time wasn't as good as mine. I spun on the balls of my feet and screamed at him to call 911. To get help. Ice. Water. Whatever. Turning back around, I yelled to the other kids to get whatever adult they had with them. I approached the kid on the ground. Gray matter visible through his fractured skull and blood pooling around him belied his true condition. I almost wished he was already dead. I still hear his screams to this day. He was calling for Jesus. Calling for help. As an atheist, I didn't know what to say to him. But his crying was becoming more frantic, and the color was fading from his skin. The kids had finally found an adult. 
His aunt. Fuck. She was frantic. It was all I could do to hold her back from moving the boy. She kicked and fought, but no way was I letting her move that kid. What if he had broken his back? Finally, more adults had gotten to the scene and had gotten the aunt to calm down. Still no 911, so I pulled out my phone and made a call to Steve to see what he was doing. The aunt saw my phone and jumped to conclusions. You better not be taking any pictures, you sick fuck. She screamed. Like the boys, her words still echo in my skull. The boy had grown quiet and still by the time the ambulance arrived. He was still alive when they took him away, but I learned later that he didn't make it. I never asked his name. I thought maybe if he was just some nameless kid, I could get over it easier. I wish now that I knew who he was. This isn't as creepy as some of the other stories here, but it actually happened, so maybe it gets bonus points. When I was in elementary school, I attended an after-school daycare-ish program because my parents worked too late to pick me up right after school and didn't want me home alone. It was cool, though, because I got to hang out with friends and play dodgeball and shit for hours every day. On Wednesdays, though, my parents worked later than usual, and I was often the last kid to leave the school. Oftentimes, it ended up meaning that I was leaving the school when the lights were turning off, in the winter, this also meant that it was already dark outside. I don't know if you guys have ever been in a school at night, but they freak me the fuck out when nothing is happening, let alone what happened this particular night. One Wednesday evening, I was walking back to the cafeteria, where we usually hang out as it gets late, from the bathroom. The bathroom was located at the opposite end of the hall that leads to the cafeteria. On the bathroom's end of the hall is the computer room, where we learn to type and play the magic school bus games, etc. You know how computer processors have those lights that blink quickly when they are going through a lot of information. Well, those lights and the computer monitor power lights were the only things lit in the computer room. As I am leaving the bathroom, I glance over to the computer room and notice a couple of the lights in the computer room go out. They light back up, and then the ones next to them go out. It was not totally unusual, but I was mesmerized by the time the lights went out and came back on, it was slower than one would expect. They continue going out, turning back on, until the lights reach the door, which, I just then noticed, was ajar. It shut. I fucking bolted back to the cafeteria. It's 5 AM, and I hear a horrible, almost hollow crashing sound outside, like an empty dumpster dropped off a building. I slip on my shoes and go outside, seeing as how it's New Year's Day and someone might have plowed drunk into a parked car or the dumpster at the end of the block. When I walk out, I hear someone's voice screaming, but it sounds like people off in a parking lot somewhere are goofing off. After a couple seconds of listening, I can make out that the person is screaming, oh my god. Hello? Hello? Oh god. Over and over. I run back inside and put on warm pants and a coat, then run outside again and start making my way to the edge of the freeway next to my house. It's very dark, and before I reach the freeway, I can hear the trucks passing by hitting debris along the road. I get to the edge of the freeway, and I see a dark, mangled hulk of a BMW on its roof in the opposite lane. No one is there. I climb the guardrail and make my way across the lanes to the car, but stop short of tripping on a mass in the road that looked like a pile of clothes. Good thing I grabbed my flashlight before I left the house. I shine my light and see the mangled corpse of a woman, her neck stretched and twisted, her brain spilling from what used to be the top of her head. Her eyes were smashed and mangled, and her jaw was broken beyond recognition, giving her a sickening expression. Her bright, crimson blood pooled at my feet as I noticed something glowing under what was left of her jacket. I used my toe and moved the corner away until I saw her phone still on with 911 displayed on its cracked screen. A voice on the phone came through the speaker, Hello? Hello? Becky? Are you still with me? I thought I'd share with you all my own story, and it's quite topical as I actually have my mom laid up on my couch here in Sydney, Australia, while she recovers from an ankle reconstruction. We got talking about this last night, so I thought I'd share it while the memory was still fresh. First off, I'm going to throw a caveat out. This story is true, I haven't embellished it, which makes it even more creepy, and everyone in my family who visited us while living in this house backs it up. Sorry, the story is a bit long, but a lot went on. I hope you packed a lunch. It all goes back to about 1982 to 1985. I was 3 to 5 years old, I have a sister who is 1 year younger, and my parents had just moved into a house in Brisbane. My dad was a journalist, now passed away, and my mother is a midwife who, at this stage, had taken some time off to be at home with us. The house itself was a single story at the front and went into a double story at the back. The front of the house had the living room and my room, while the back of the house was joined by a carpeted landing with stairs that went up to a master bedroom on the left, 
a nursery straight ahead, and a bathroom to the right. At the bottom of the stairs was a side door leading onto an entertainment slash barbecue area with a backyard out the back. If you turned right at the base of the stairs, and did not go out the side door to the concrete entertainment area, you passed under an arch frame that led into a large L-shaped concrete rumpus room under the house. Inside the L-shaped rumpus room, and under the stairs above, there was dark tiled laundry. At the back of the rumpus room was another back door leading directly out to the backyard. Got me so far? Good. Sorry for the architectural intro. Dad would often work late at night, so he was barely home, do the math on that one and work out why they later divorced, lol, so mum was often left in this house at night with my brother and sister for company. Mum said the first thing she noticed after a month or two of living there was that our old dog Mandy would refuse to enter the house, and she spent all of her time in the backyard in her kennel. Apparently, if mom was bringing in the washing, the dog would happily follow up until the back door, but as soon as she reached the back door, her tail would drop and she would start whimpering. Mom thought it was odd, but nothing more got said. She put it down to the dog being a dog, then weirder things started happening. The laundry would flood for no reason, with adjacent rooms left completely dry. Mom and dad would walk down the back of the house to find light bulbs shattered from their sockets. Mom said she absolutely detested walking in the back of the house at night, as she said that as soon as she entered the stairway or landing area, her hair would stand on end. She told me it felt like someone was watching me as I walked past or on the stairs. As you can imagine, checking on my baby sister at night soon became an event to dread, when ordinarily she should have been happy to do so. The weirdness continued, however, it started to ramp up over a few months when mom and dad said they used to hear shuffling feet coming from the rumpus room below when they would be lying in bed at night. Often, mom said she would be knitting or watching TV at the front of the house by herself, only to hear laughter coming from the back of the house. She'd get up to check, but of course I would be asleep, and nothing would be there. One night, my aunt and my 18-month-old cousin came to stay while my dad and my uncle painted my grandmother's lounge room walls one night after work. My mom and aunt both chatted about their babies, me being a toddler and my sister being a year younger, and my aunt mentioned that my cousin was currently going through teething and was spending some nights crying. This night in particular, my cousin was a little bit in pain, so my mother volunteered to drive down to the local pharmacy and pick up some vanilla, teething gel, to help numb the pain, as we had run out. My mother said to my aunt, look Jenny, I think there is something wrong with the house, but Phil, my dad, doesn't believe me, so I'm just warning you, if you hear something, I want you to let me know. Aunt, what do you mean? Mom, well, I have been hearing some weird things that I really can't explain, and frankly, I'm a little bit scared. Aunt, oh rubbish. I'm a very spiritual person, and I have been in a friend's house that was apparently haunted, and I picked up on it, so I can tell you there is nothing wrong with this house. Mom, oh, okay, well, I just wanted to let you know. I'll be back in about 20 to 30 minutes anyway, see you soon. Mom got back from the pharmacy to find my uncle's car in front of our house. Sensing something wasn't right, Mom walked in to find my sobbing aunt trying to be consoled by my uncle, while my dad was poking fun at her. Dad, get spooked, did you, Jen? Gaffa mom, you heard something, didn't you? Aunt, after you left, I could feel thumps coming through the floorboards and something called my name and laughed from the back of the house. This house is bulls and percent hash. Petrified, my mom tried to find out what was causing this. She got chatting with a neighbor who said that the previous renter went a bit crazy and went downhill after a messy divorce. She got into some weird religion and often would have people come by the house every few weeks where they would hold seances in the house. Being a churchgoer, at this stage, mom said she felt a shiver go up her spine as she started realizing what may have been an explanation for what was going on. It turns out the woman was a Satanist. Mom asked, where did they use to hold these seances, do you know? The neighbor replied, oh, we used to see them put candles in the rumpus room windows, so they used to hold them in there. Needless to say, mom was determined to move out from that point on. Dad, of course, really didn't believe her, so they were staying put. Needless to say, despite all our toys and trikes being in the rumpus room, mom said I would never play down there. She had just put it down to kids not wanting to leave their mother's feet at such a young age. My older cousin, who was a year older than me, flatly refused to go down to the rumpus room when she visited. She told my aunt and mom that things down there spooked her out. A few more months went by, and apparently I started complaining to my mom about Amon who sat on top of my wardrobe looking at me at night. She got rid of the wardrobe. A few weeks later, she was getting changed in her room at the top of the house, I was down the front of the house watching Sesame Street, and when she went to get out of her room, she found the door was locked. She started shaking the door, but it wouldn't open. 
She called out to me, but I wouldn't have heard her. Seven months pregnant with my baby brother, four years younger than me, at this stage, she was forced to shimmy down the drain pipe and onto the side entertainment area, a dignified pose for a pregnant woman. She came back up through the side door, up the stairs, to find her door wide open and unlocked. She came and scolded me and said, Mark, don't ever lock mummy in her room again. I apparently claimed in black and blue that I hadn't stopped watching TV. Mom believed me. About this time, she decided enough was enough, and so she approached their local pastor to ask what to do. He suggested two options, one, they ignore it and hope it goes away, or two, they play loud hymns and read Bible verses to try and anger whatever was there into leaving. He also said that it could anger them, and they might throw stuff around. My great-grandmother, who was a very religious person, walked into the rumpus room one day and told my mother, there are evil, evil faces looking at me and leering at me down there after walking downstairs to get a toy for me. A pastor later confirmed that, take it or leave it, and you might think I'm mad, but you have two to three demonic manifestations or entities residing in the back of your house. That was the last straw. Mom packed our stuff and started looking for another house. My dad and she were divorcing at this stage, so he was gone frequently. But this wouldn't be the evil's last parting shot. My mother, about a few days out from moving, went to check on my sister, who was now two, while she was asleep in the top story nursery, now her room. On checking her cot, she found it, to her terror, to be empty. The window above it, and it was one of those old design heavy horizontal sliding windows with a vertical latch halfway up one side, was wide open, and the fly screen behind it had its rubber seal hanging in the breeze, with a flap of fly screen swinging in the breeze. Underneath her window was an annex over the back door, which now had a huge dent in the fiberglass of it, and its supports were broken. There was my sister crawling around the backyard, with the dog playing beside her. Mum freaked out and rang the doctor ASAP, who came and checked her out. She was fine, but had a bit of a concussion. When mum, dad, he was home at the time, and the doctor asked what happened, she exclaimed, doggy, down, down, down. Evidently, she had fallen, although falling out of a window that she couldn't climb out of, reach, or open seems a bit too convenient, out the window and had seen the dog running around the backyard beneath her. Needless to say, we were gone that day. Every word of this is true. I have two true stories. First story, when I was a kid, about 13 years old, my best friend and her family moved out of state. I used to hang out at her house when things got rough at my own home, and she worried about leaving me without a refuge or place to go. Her family had been renting their old house, and when they left, she broke out a small window in the kitchen door so that I could still get in if I needed to. I got into the habit of hanging out there. I guess that made me brave about old, empty houses. Around that time, my brother and I went exploring and found a similar old, empty house down by the lake. The kitchen door had a small window broken out, just like my friend's house. We broke in, and the place looked really deserted. There was a bunch of junk in boxes. There was a stepladder in the middle of the room with a five-gallon bucket on the shelf thingy where you set your paint can. My brother and I went upstairs to check the place out, and as we got to the top of the stairs, we heard a piano being played on the first floor. We are scared we are going to get caught. The house must not have been totally abandoned, and we booked it back down the stairs. At the bottom, the stepladder has been moved to the very base of the stairs, and the bucket is upended on the floor. All over the floor and stairs, there is scattered sheet music. No piano, just sheet music. It freaked us both out. In retrospect, it was probably someone homeless in the house, but I still have no idea where the music came from. Second story, in Florida, I lived in this little, bitty house. There was a time that my husband and I were separated for about six months. I had nightmares during that time that a woman was at the house trying to take my family. In the dream, she would call my kids' names to lure them outside. It always woke me up in a panic. The week that my husband and I reconciled and he moved back in, we had the kids spend the night at their grandparents'. We were just about to fall asleep when this female voice called my husband's name in the hall. The bathroom light in the hall flicked on. My husband says, who the hell was that? And jumps out of bed. No one was there. The house was empty, and the doors were locked. It absolutely terrified the crap out of me. Maybe I hadn't been dreaming after all. I went to boarding school, so there were a number of creepy things I heard about happening at the school. Normally, it was stuff like kids would play Ouija and the school would get a phone call from the leader of the local Wiccan community to stop, but sometimes it was a lot stranger. First off, the junior and senior boys dorm is called upper school, and in the early part of the 20th century, a student hung themselves in one of the rooms there. Since then, the dorm has definitely been haunted. 
there is actually a challenge to staying in upper school alone for a whole night in the room where he hung himself. In any case, a number of strange things have happened. I know of a number of people who've lived in that room who've said that they've woken up in the middle of the night, usually around 3 a.m., completely conscious but unable to move. They've all described it as if someone were laying on top of you. There's only one person I know of who's attempted to stay in upper school alone. She went to bed as normal until suddenly awaking at 3 a.m. to hear a door open and close and footsteps pitter-patter down the hall. Thinking someone was playing a prank on her, she opened the door and looked out into the hall. Of course, no one was there, so she went back to sleep. Later, she awoke again with the distinct feeling that someone was watching her. Again, she heard the door open and the footsteps in the hall. This time, she fully went out into the hall. When she got outside the room, the door slammed shut behind her. Absolutely terrified, she booked it out. When she and a faculty member went back the next day, they couldn't open the door because all of the furniture was pushed against the door. When I was six and my brother was eight, we had a room in a town home with a shared wall. Creepy things would happen in that room, mainly due to our imagination. We once had a friend who was a black widow spider that would come out at night and hang out in the corner by the door. We would talk to it and make up stories about what it did during the day. Anyway, one night we were trying to get to sleep, but we kept hearing a pounding on the wall. We let it happen for a while before we screamed for our mom. She was disheveled at the time and came into the room and said, what? We explained to her that there was a repeated banging against the wall. But when she came into the room, it stopped. She said that it was just the wind. Keep in mind that this was a very likely explanation due to the fact that it was monsoon season in Arizona. She said she would come in and check on us in a bit. That evening was a difficult one for her. She was breaking up with her boyfriend due to his drug abuse issues. So dealing with creepy sounds was not at the top of the list. Not five minutes after she left, the banging continued. This time louder, somehow closer. I screamed again and ran out into the living room. My mom was standing in a very defensive posture with tears streaming down her face, and her boyfriend looked very angry. He grunted and immediately left. Went outside and in his car, he held down on the horn for a good minute before finally leaving. I guess it was his rage. She was so relieved when he left and made sure to lock the door, the bolt, and the chain. She brought me back to our room, where my brother said that the sound stopped once I screamed and left the room. My mom sat in the room with us and talked to us until we fell asleep. There was no more banging that night, and in the morning, my mom woke us up early and sat us down in the living room. This was something that never happened. She didn't mention the breakup with her boyfriend, there was something more pressing. Our door knob was busted and unlocked, and someone had scraped at our bolt lock. There were a half dozen police officers outside. She explained to us that the neighbors had been broken into, and they had tried to get into our house as well. Luckily for our additional security measures, the bolt lock and chain, they couldn't get in. She brought us over to talk with the neighbors. We played with the kids next door a lot, and they happened to be staying at their grandma's that night for a sleepover. We walked around their house to see that everything was gone. Everything. Even their food had been stripped from their cabinets. One thing became apparent during our tour of the house, they were avoiding their living room. There were many police officers there, interviewing the mom. When we finally got to the living room, we found out why. The wall of their living room was connected to our bedroom. There was an indent in the wall about six feet in diameter and about a foot deep. It turns out that the robbers were trying to break into our house through our shared wall. They broke into three other houses that night via the front door, but none of the others had bolt locks. Somehow, the robbers thought it would be easier to chisel through the wall than to get through the bolt lock. What they weren't prepared for was the fact that our particular unit was added after the other units. The shared wall was actually a solid brick exterior wall, unlike all the other shared walls in the complex. They had spent hours trying to get through when they could have easily just busted down the door. After that day, my mom never told us that a noise was just the wind ever again. A couple years ago, some friends and I decided to take a couple weeks off work to go on a road trip. Our goal was to drive through the states from the southeast up to Pennsylvania and back. We would drive through the night and pitch our tents before dusk, sleep a little, and spend the day checking out the area we stopped in. Sometimes it would be out in the middle of nowhere, sometimes near a city. It was an interesting way to do things. We were driving through Alabama when we made our stop. The thing about Alabama is that the interstate through it is incredibly boring. Pretty much straight and a lot of trees. We knew this in advance, so we charted a path that would have us drive through the more rural areas. We got about three quarters of the way through going from south to north when we decided to stop for the morning. We found a large patch of field that didn't have any no trespassing signs visible and set up camp. 
since we took turns driving, the rest of us took naps in the car. When we stopped to camp, it was mostly to rest out of the car. It was mostly to be able to take a nap without being cramped together or having someone else drool on you. It was about noon when everyone was ready to pack up and explore. The spot we camped in was a beautiful, short grass field. About 500 or so feet from where we chilled was a barn. It looked new and was really picturesque. We packed everything back into the car and decided to hoof it over to the barn and check it out. Everyone took off in different directions when we got there to look around. I was on the side, poking around the tall grass that had started to conceal some equipment, when I heard one of my friends yelling. I walk into the barn, and the other two have already joined my loud friend. They were standing around what looked to be a trap door on the floor near the back of the barn. My friend tells us she heard crying, and when she found the trap door, it stopped. We all stood there for a minute in silence, listening. All we heard was the wind blowing through the barn. I look up and start to say something when, out of nowhere, there is a large crash. It sounded like something slammed against the other side of the trap door. Everyone booked without a second glance. Except me. I couldn't move. My legs didn't work. I just stood there, staring at the door in wide-eyed terror. My brain was screaming for me to run, begging my legs to move, but I couldn't. Then, like a rubber band snapping into place, my body spun 180 degrees in the opposite direction. After what felt like an eternity, my legs decided to act. Just as I felt my left leg start to push off, the world went black. Pitch black. It looked and felt like someone threw a heavy blanket over me. Then the screaming started. It sounded like a young child screaming at the top of their lungs. It never stopped. There was no pause for breath. I think I screamed. I say I think because I couldn't hear myself screaming over the child's scream. I felt something icy cold in my chest, and I started having trouble breathing. It felt like something had grabbed my heart. Primal survival instincts kicked in, and I began to thrash my arms around, hoping to hit something, anything that would make it stop. It didn't help. I gathered as much strength as I could and forced myself to run. I didn't know where I was, and it didn't matter, I just had to run. And I did full speed, straight into a low-hanging beam. I was down and out. I don't know for long. I just remember waking up in the grass near my car. My left eye was sealed shut from dried blood. Everyone was sitting next to the car, not talking. When they noticed I had woken up, they helped me get cleaned up. I used a bottle of water to clean the blood off my face and bandages from my first aid kit to cover the heart gash in my forehead. I asked what happened. They told me that they had made it to the car when they realized that I wasn't with them. Of course, since it was my car, I had the keys, so they were looked out for. That was when they heard me screaming. They actually told me they were running to the town to get the police instead of going back for me. I never asked why they decided to come back for me, I was just glad that they did. They told me that when they found me, I was laying on the floor bleeding. The trap door was wide open. They actually dragged me across the floor by my feet because no one would come around the other side of me and have their back to the door. Here's the kicker. After they explain all this to me, one of them tells me to turn around and check out the barn. I look behind me, and the beautiful barn we saw and went to investigate is now decrepit and old. I look back at my friends, and they stare back with blank expressions. Without saying anything else, I hand my keys to one of my friends and drive off. We didn't camp out like that again for the rest of the trip. We found campgrounds to stay at, or we just slept in the car. None of us have mentioned the incident since. I have one. This happened to me when I was younger. My bedroom was in the basement of our house. Every Sunday afternoon, my mom, sister, and I went to my grandma's house for dinner. My stepdad always went duck hunting on the weekends, so he was gone all day. This Sunday, my mom left before me, and I was going to drive separately. So, I'm in the basement with my dog, and he starts barking, which was strange because he really never barked. I wasn't sure why he was barking, so I started walking from my room, down the hallway, and to the stairs to see if my mom or stepdad had come back. My dog follows me. I get to the bottom of the stairs, and I hear someone walking around upstairs. Without thinking twice, I just assumed my mom had forgotten something and come back or my dad had returned from hunting. I start walking up the stairs, and my dog runs past me, around the corner, and into the kitchen. Just as I get to the top of the stairs, I hear my dog start barking again. I stop just before I reach the top of the stairs, and I hear a voice I don't recognize whispering, shh, shh, it's okay. It was not my mom or stepdad. I lost my shit I ran back downstairs and into a storage room where we had a handgun. I grabbed it, loaded it, and waited for whoever it was to come down the stairs. I was literally so scared that I was ready to shoot on sight. I hear more walking around, and then nothing. 
There is no sound of the person leaving the door or anything, it just stops. My dog comes running back downstairs, and I in turn run down the hallway, up the stairs, and out the garage door, which was at the top of the stairs. I drive to my grandma's and ask my mom if she'd come back home. She hadn't. I didn't mention it to my stepdad because he'd been gone hunting all day and there was no way he'd come home. Okay, whatever, maybe a neighbor walked into our house, despite the doors being locked, which my mom and I confirmed upon returning from my grandma's. I chalk it up to my imagination or the sounds of the house settling or whatever, and I never really think about it again. About a year later, my other set of grandparents came to town for a week to visit. Everyone except my grandpa leaves on Saturday morning to go shopping at the mall. Nothing out of the ordinary. About a year later, my stepdad and I are laughing about some show on TV about ghosts. He turns to me and says, you know, your grandpa says he heard a ghost in our house. I'd forgotten all about my experience, and my stepdad started telling me what my grandpa had said. Apparently, after we'd left to go to the mall that Saturday, he was in the basement painting our family room, grandpa always came out to help with house projects, but grandma always took us shopping. My stepdad, not knowing about my story, I didn't tell him because I was afraid he'd get mad at me for touching the handgun, tells me that the dog started barking and my grandpa heard someone walking around upstairs. He figured we'd just forgotten something and come back from shopping. But after a few seconds of hearing footsteps and nobody coming downstairs or saying anything, he stops painting and heads up the stairs. The dog runs upstairs and keeps barking, and my grandpa hears someone talking to the dog. Without thinking twice, he just goes upstairs, thinking we'd come back, and it's one of us talking to the dog but there's nobody there. The doors are locked. Of course, at this point, I remember what happened to me, and I tell my stepdad about it. So, basically, two different people, without knowing each other's story, have the exact same experience of hearing someone clearly walking around our house despite there being nobody there. That was about 20 years ago, when I was 14 or so, and, having now told the story for the first time in many years, it must say it seemed much creepier back then. I don't believe in ghosts or any of that shit, but it was certainly something I can't explain. Unfortunately, this one is true. But both my little sister and I have moved on, and we're both doing well, with little or no psychological scars, they fade. I was about 10 years old, and my sister was 8 at the time. I had come home from drama practice at the school kind of late, about 8p.m. My mom wasn't home at the time, and I knew to be careful because my stepdad usually started drinking around 8 or 9. I knew something was wrong upon entering my house because my sister wasn't watching cartoons like she usually did before she fell asleep. So I look for her up in her room, and I find her curled up in her bed. I asked her why she wasn't watching TV, and she told me, because daddy is downstairs screaming. Because my little sister couldn't really grasp the whole idea of being drunk, I asked her, is daddy acting silly again? And she replied glumly, yeah, but he brought a friend over to play, but he didn't look so happy to play with him. Right away, a red flag appeared. I knew something wasn't right. I knew my mom wouldn't be home for a while, so we were on our own, and I needed to know what was going on. I opened the door to the cellar, and sure enough, I heard these sounds. They weren't yelling or screaming. It was more of a wet gurgle, I guess you can say. I heard my stepdad talking, but he was slurring his speech, and I honestly couldn't make out what he was saying. He was pretty destroyed at this point. So I sit there on the top of the stairs, listening, slowly inching my way down, just enough so I can peek around the corner to see what he was doing. When I finally got there, what I saw was something I will never forget. He had a family friend, I didn't know him, but I knew his face because he came over every once in a while, on the ground, beaten and bloodied. His shirt was ripped, and he had burn marks all over him. It was then that I heard the faint hiss of dad's welder turn on. I saw him, bottle to his mouth and welder in his hands, slowly wobble over the man until the flaming hot tip reached his back. As he was screaming, the man looked up and saw me and just screamed, run. My dad stopped what he was doing, dropped the welder on the man's back, still burning him, and started to approach me. I stepped backward, tripped, and fell. As I was scrambling backwards, struggling to get to my feet, all I could hear was him yelling, you want to be like me, son? He takes a swig of his bottle and says, I'm your daddy, I'll protect you. No, 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 don't cry. It's okay. Don't cry. Don't you fucking cry you little shit. I got up, and I ran. I ran so fast. I made it out of the door and around the back of the house to yell up to my sister to use her escape ladder, which we had at all times, just in case my stepdad flipped out like this and we needed to get out, and I helped her down, and we went to the police. I will never forget that day.
All stories are true stories passed down through the family. My grandmother's mother was a terrible person, according to her. She never really wanted to talk about herself. When they were young, they lived in a small shack in Arkansas. I have a picture somewhere I'd post, but I can't find it. It's a small, two or three room house, basically in the middle of nowhere, as most houses in those days were. When grandma did talk about her mom, she referred to her as a witch. She'd have people over at weird times of the night doing weird things in her room, etc. One night, my grandma, her sisters, and her brother were sitting in the main room, and her mother was in her room doing things with some people when her grandmother screamed at the top of her lungs and the door to the room slammed open. My grandmother, who had died a few weeks prior, stepped through the door. Only her features were distorted, she looked like a cartoon character version of her grandmother. She moved across the room quickly and grabbed my grandmother, then, maybe eight years old, by the hand and said, come with me and tried to drag her to the front door. Her mother, now standing at the door to her room, screamed at my grandmother not to go with her, and that was not her grandmother. There might have been more to that event, but my grandmother wasn't very good at finishing stories. There was another time that her mother sold her to a black man when she was a kid, but she never actually told us that story, she just mentioned that it had happened. The old house my mom used to live in when my mother was young, she left home for a short time to go live with her sister, who had gotten married. They lived in a farmhouse in McMinnville, Oregon. The house was an old, white, two-story thing sitting in a wheat field on the edge of a forest. I actually lived there for a short time myself in another house built near the spot of the old house. The house would always make weird creaking noises, you'd hear people walking around the house when no one else was there, or you'd hear voices. Animals wouldn't go inside the house. Cats, dogs, they had them all, but not a single animal would set foot inside the house itself. You would see people walking down the hallways, but no one would be there, etc., standard scary house shit. In the room my mother was staying in, she'd always thought something was odd, it seemed like there was too much room between her room and the room next to it, like there was space between the rooms, but there wasn't anything there. Eventually, my aunt and her husband ripped that house down to build a new one, and when they were taking the house down, between my mom's room and the back room, there was a small hallway that led to a small room, or closet. There was an old chair in there facing the wall with a large demonic painting of Satan just hanging there. They burned the remaining bits of the house after that. Years later, I actually went to live in the new house they had constructed, just about 20 feet from the foundation of the old house, and other than falling out of bed one night, nothing strange really happened there. However, they have since torn down that house and bought a manufactured home, double wide, which now sits on the foundation of the original house, and weird shit has begun to happen there, so. Take from that what you will. Shatter Snake my grandmother, whom I don't take for a liar, once told me about how she was walking to school one day with her siblings when they came upon a large snake crossing the road. Her brother picked up a rock and threw it at the snake, and it shattered into a bunch of little pieces like it was made of glass, but then continued on its way like nothing had happened. It wasn't until much later, when the internet was actually a thing, that I looked up Shatter Snake and found out it's actually a thing. The thing in the attic this one actually happened to me, and looking back, it's entirely possible that I'm seeing this through the lens of an overactive imagination and that all the shit I thought I saw I didn't see. But then there's physical evidence to back up some of it, so it's hard to say for sure what actually went down. When I was very young, I lived on a street in Fresno, California, called Villa. The house we moved into instantly became awesome when the people who moved out left behind a friggin' castle of Grayskull in the garage. So for me, the house was cool, but for my sisters, not so much. At night, my oldest sister would hear something walking around in the attic, just in her room alone. I never heard anything from my room. But she constantly said she would hear what sounded like footsteps and scratching just above her bed and around in various parts of the room. My little sister sometimes heard it, but not as frequently. One night, so as to call her bluff sort of, I slept in her bed in her room, and she slept in mine. The night was going fine, I didn't hear or see anything the entire time I lay awake in her bed, so finally I went to sleep. Sometime in the early hours of the morning, I woke up to something clunking around just above my head. It sounded like something walking around in the attic, but there was a distinct scratchy after sound like it was dragging around or something. It scared the shit out of me, and I ran into my parents' room. Fast forward a few months, kittens were born, and everyone was happy to play with kittens. Well, until one day we came home in the vent just above the front door that vents air from the attic, there was a kitten with its head pressed against the screen vent, mewing its head off like it was scared out of its mind or something. So my dad gets a chair from the kitchen and puts it in my sister's closet because, of course, the door to the attic has to be in her closet. But he's too big to fit in it, 
so the burden falls on me. He gives me a lighter, and I climb up on the chair and then onto the shelf in the closet and poke my head up into the attic to try and get this stupid cat. So there I am with the top part of my body fully exposed in the attic. I'm careful not to look behind me over the area that is my sister's room. I look straight ahead to the front door area and to the kitten. I try and try and try to get the kitten to come to me. I call to the kitten and hold out my hand, but it's scared of me. Finally, I get the kitten to come close enough to grab it, and without thinking, I turn around to sit on the shelf that I was previously kneeling on and turn to face the area of the attic that extends over my sister's room. I come face to face with what I can only describe as a very large dog-like creature kneeling over almost face to face with me. It's not moving, it's not making a sound, it's not even breathing, as far as I can tell, it doesn't blink, it doesn't do anything, it just stares at me. At this point, I'm flipping the fuck out. I drop the kitten from the attic, straighten my body, and fall out of the closet just in time to hear something in the attic make a loud crashing sound. I ran as fast as my feet could carry me out the front door and refused to enter the house again. I spent the next two weeks at my grandma's apartment. No one believes me except my sisters, and my dad goes up there to see what's in the attic and finds nothing. Months later, I've forgotten the entire incident. My mom, sisters, and I are out at the store, and my dad is sitting on the couch, cleaning and loading his handgun, drunk, because he's a genius like that. And accidentally fires a shot into the ceiling. He hears what he described as a half screech or howl of pain and a loud crash in my sister's room. Some brown dog-like creature comes tearing ass down the hallways towards him and enters the living room. The front door is open, and it bolts out the front door. My mother, sisters, and I return home to the story, the broken porthole in my sister's closet with scratch marks on the wall and closet trim, and the neighbors saying they saw something weird run out of the house and down the street. The happiest thing ever to happen to me was when I was in college. I was sitting alone in my room browsing the web, and I kept hearing scratching, but it wasn't really registering in my mind. Eventually, it gets annoying enough to attract my full attention, and I look around to find out what it is. Finally, after hunting around, I discovered that it's coming from a two-foot-high white trash bin that has an empty liter of cola in it. I get close enough to see the empty bottle, and it starts moving a little. It feels like something small is under it, moving around. So I'm thinking, great, there's a mouse in my trash bin. Now it's important to note that I don't take my eyes off of this trash bin, as I'm assuming there is a mouse in it ready to dart at me, and I don't want a mouse to do that. I wanted to be prepared for the darting. So I get close enough to almost see into the bottom of the bin, and the bottle stops moving. So I gather my courage for what I assume is a tiny mouse and look into the bin, and there is not a single thing other than the empty bottle in the bin. I move the bottle around and can see through it clearly. Nothing. I was stunned, as I was just watching this bottle move around and didn't see anything jump out of this small white trash bin. So I did what any manly man would do. I went and hung out with some friends in a different dorm room until my roommate got back from work. I found myself checking into a hotel at the last minute on business in another country. Since it was last minute, I could not get a room at the normal hotels and had to book at some place I had never heard of on the outskirts of the city. The area was considered dangerous for kidnappings and robberies. As far as I could tell, I was the only visitor. There was something very odd about the sole mirror in the room. It was hung at a very strange angle. You could not really use it to look at yourself from where it was positioned, but I noticed from my bed that the mirror pointed to some corner of the wall near the top of the ceiling. I thought nothing of it until I turned out the lights. I noticed, for some reason, that though the rest of the room was pitch black, I could see slightly the reflection in the mirror, sometimes brighter and sometimes dimmer. It occurred to me then that there was a heating vent over to the left that I could probably see in the mirror if I were sitting exactly in the center of the bed, and I was seeing the faint green IR beam reflection in the mirror from a camera mounted in the vent, and it was actively moving and scanning the room in the dark. I went to the bathroom, got changed, grabbed my bag, and left without checking, grabbing the first taxi I spotted. I am pretty sure that to this day I was being sized up for a robbery or worse. 100% true story. I don't know if it'll scare you but it remains one of the scariest things I've ever experienced. When I was 17, I was at a party at a friend's house. We grew up in a small town with lots of woods, no street lights, houses far apart from one another, etc. There was virtually no crime in this town, except for the abduction of a fifth grader about a decade earlier. Her remains were found behind a restaurant in the town years later, but the case was never solved. My friends and I had been drinking all night, so I didn't want to drive home. That happened to me frequently enough that I always had a sleeping bag in the trunk of my car. Around 2 a.m., I ran out to get the sleeping bag. It was pouring out with thunder and lightning. 
I could barely see my car, which was parked just beyond the driveway on the side of the road. When I got to it, I popped the trunk and dug around for my sleeping bag. There was a flash of lightning, and the street lit up for a second. That's when I noticed a middle-aged man standing a few feet from me. He didn't move, he just stood completely still. I can't remember what I said. For all I know, I probably just gasped. However, I remember exactly what he said. I just love thunder and lightning storms, don't you? Not hello or even sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. I slammed my trunk shut, my sleeping bag still in there, and sprinted back to the house. I immediately told everyone what happened. Of course they were drunk, and they thought I was making it up, but I forced them to look out the window toward the driveway. After 30 seconds, lightning struck, and the street lit up again. Sure enough, there was the man walking down the street, in the opposite direction from the house. I grew up in a tiny, tiny town in northern Ontario. Every Friday, most of the neighborhood would gather in Jeanette and Emile's kitchen and tell stories for hours. I was only five or six, the only kid on the block, so I'd usually read or play with my toys in one of the two guest bedrooms until I fell asleep. One night, I couldn't sleep because I could hear a baby crying. I came out into the kitchen and complained to my mom. She told me to go back to sleep, but Jeanette, an experienced grandmother at the time, pulled a cookie out of the cookie jar and sent me to the living room to watch TV instead. Because of the way the house was laid out, the living room was right next to the kitchen, and I could hear the adults talking. I'm 22 now, in Texas, and it still creeps me the fuck out. When we first moved here, Jeanette started, there was a cross hanging up in the guest room. We're not really religious, and there was a lot of other crap from the old owners hanging up, so we took it all down. Their bedroom was in the basement, closest to the heater, and the kitchen, living room, and guest rooms were all upstairs. We used to hear something running around upstairs, like a kid, eh? We thought it was just the dog or the cat. But one weekend, Emil took the dogs hunting, and the cat wouldn't come in that night. So I was downstairs, alone, and I heard the footsteps. I came up to investigate, and I could hear a baby crying. Now, the neighbors were too far apart for it to be one of their kids. And their house backed up into a field that went on for miles and miles. She was confused and wound up calling the cops because the baby just would not stop crying. The OPP came, a grizzled older guy and his partner, and the older man remembered the house from when he'd been called there three years ago, when Harrison's toddler was found dead in its crib. They searched the yard and the house, but didn't hear anything. Offhandedly, they suggested she find the cross and put it back on the wall. She did. And she never heard the baby again. When my mother went in to get my stuff so we could leave, she realized that when I was playing, I'd knocked the small cross off the wall. My good friend, I'll call him Andrew for the sake of his privacy, just in case, had been talking to a girl, Lily, from the UK for almost a year online. She was cute, sweet, and had all kinds of friends and a loving family. Lily had hundreds of photos, anecdotes, and a seemingly real life. Her friends and family would all post comments on her MySpace page telling her how they had an awesome weekend, that they want to hang out with her soon, that they're sorry they missed her call, happy birthday, etc. Eventually, Andrew started to have deep feelings for Lily. He told his parents about her, then his close friends. Andrew bought endless amounts of calling cards and would phone her whenever it was convenient for them both. At about nine months into it, Lily expressed an interest in moving to the US so she could be closer to Andrew. There had been talk about moving in together. Lily told Andrew she had spoken to her parents, and they suggested that she visit with a friend before committing to a move. Andrew was over the goddamn moon. He walked around for weeks talking about Lily and how amazing she was and how she was going to be visiting for a week, and we all had to meet her. When Andrew picked up Lily and her friend from the airport, Lily wasn't there. The two individuals he met called themselves Jenny and Sam, sister and brother, or so they claimed. The story was that Lily became anxious and nervous about flying overseas to meet the love of her life and swapped her ticket out for Sam at the last minute. Jenny and Sam were supposed to see if Andrew was who he claimed to be, as well as scope out the area and check out the town. When Andrew returned home, he talked online with Lily for a few hours, with her apologizing profusely. He reassured her, told her it was okay, and that he understood her nervousness. I met Jenny and Sam at a party. Andrew was towing them everywhere, trying to impress them so that they had only good things to report back to Lily. Jenny and Sam were normal. They stuck together the whole time, drank some beers, laughed at jokes, and struck up conversations. The only thing that could have seemed odd was the number of photos they were taking. But at the same time, it was assumed that they were trying to document their trip for Lily. A couple of days before Jenny and Sam had to leave, they told Andrew the truth, honestly, 
I don't know if it's the real truth, and I don't think I'll ever know. Their names weren't Jenny and Sam. They weren't related. There was no Lily, Lily was really someone named Alicia. All the photos of Lily on MySpace were taken from Alicia's MySpace. The photos of family members and friends were all of Alicia's friends, but with different names. All of the comments on Lily's profile and photos were fabricated. They were put there by these fake friends and relatives. Alicia had no idea that this doppelganger profile existed. Alicia had no idea that Andrew existed. Jenny and Sam told Andrew that there was a fake profile for him as well. They showed it to him. His doppelganger was named Justin or something like that. Justin had all of the same family members and friends that Andrew had, but with different names. They told Andrew they'd been playing this game for a while, but it wasn't just them. They could count 20 people off the top of their heads that were in on this game, from all over the world. Then they pulled out this book for Andrew to look at. This is the part that really freaked me the fuck out. It was a book about Andrew's life. Every single piece of information Andrew shared with Lily was documented in this book. There would be an excerpt from their chat logs, i.e., Andrew, I hung out with Brian today. He's my best friend. Lily, oh yeah, that's the guy with you in your default photo, right? Any pertinent information, i.e., a photo of Brian and a brief description of who he is to Andrew, and footnotes. The footnotes were extensive and unbelievable. In this example of Brian, it would include things like dating Karen P. Page 22. 2 was in a band with Eric J. Page 17, and Mike C. Page 9. 3 is Brad D's younger brother, page 11. The amount of linked information in this book was the biggest mindfuck. It was an extensive web of the network of friends and family in our group. It included all kinds of information and photos. Jenny and Sam had admitted to taking all the photos on their trip so that they could add to this book and their profiles online. Andrew kept the book and refused to give it back to them. He kicked them out of his house. He was heartbroken and shocked. Later on, he logged on to his messenger client, and Lily I met him. He told her he knew that she wasn't real, that this had been a giant what the fuckery, and he wanted to know what the person pretending to be Lily had to gain. Lily didn't respond. Lily stopped talking to Andrew. Andrew has never received a real answer in regards to what he endured. I saw the book before Andrew shredded and burned it. There was a photo and a little blurb about me in there. 1. Recently moved from, unknown city, California. 2. Dating Aaron B., page 6, a city police officer. 3. Good friends with Allison S. Page 26, and read P. Page 21, 4, hates soda, gum, and flip-flops, loves Harry Potter, beer, and cookies. This happened when I was about 5 or 6, and it's stayed clear in my mind since then. I never did figure out if it was real or just a really vivid night terror. There I was, reading my Sesame Street book, all cozy in my bunk bed with my siblings and parents fast asleep, leaving me and my imagination awake to entertain ourselves. I was a little nerdy bookworm who would read when I couldn't sleep at night, which was nearly every night, but this particular night something felt off. As I lay there, reading with only the moonlight streaming in from my bedroom window as my flashlight, I realized how cold the room had gotten. In an attempt to stave off the night chill, I set my book down next to me and pulled my quilts up closer to my chin. The book slid down and fell into the crack between the wall and my bed, so instinctively I reached down to retrieve my lost treasure. As I was pulling the book up, however, I felt a slight tug on the end of it. Like this would keep me from my grover. I pulled back, and IT pulled back. I pulled again, and it pulled back stronger. A flash of a hand could be seen then, even in the darkness, and my eyes grew wide. All of a sudden, the child in me reeled with fear, as the knowledge of all those terrible stories might possibly be true. Now, would I try to get my book back or face certain death? I'll admit, I was one risk-loving kid. This was nothing to be fooled with, though, so I let go. The book hit the hardwood floor with a thud, and I heard scraping under my bed like nails on a chalkboard. As stiff as a board, I didn't move an inch except to dart my eyes to my sleeping sister in the bed ten feet away. All I heard was the soft snore from the unmoving form, as well as from my dreaming younger brother above. The next morning, thinking it had just been a figment of my lovely imagination, I went under the bed to get back my cherished possession, only to find it nowhere to be found. All that was left was a deep scratch on the floor next to where the book should have been. Needless to say, I read in my well-lit closet with the door shut and a mound of blankets for years after. Here is a contribution from my life. From 1990 to 1997, I lived with my family in Naperville, Illinois, in a typical subdevelopment in a typical house that was built in the 1970s. I was a teenager, class of 96, go skins. 
Anyway, this house had what I jokingly refer to as a ghost parrot. That is, it mimicked sounds. I dropped a bunch of colored pencils on the tile floor of the kitchen one day. My brother and I were upstairs the following day when the exact same sound, as if it had been recorded, came from the bathroom in between our rooms. We looked inside, there was nothing on the floor. Ha! Huh. Nice one, we said. The jokes always made us feel better. Our tomcat loved to play at night, and he tore up and down the stairs just about every night, chasing who knew what. The distinct sound of cat claws on the carpet was our lullaby. My dad hated it, someone stopped that fucking cat. We don't have money to be replacing carpet all the time. Well, one night the crazy cat is playing, dad shouts, and my brother steps out of his room to put a stop to it. After a moment, he opens my door while I'm in bed reading. He asks me if I've been listening to the cat tearing up and down the steps. Of course, he says, um. Us too. It's just that. What? I ask. I get up and follow him to his room. In his closet, the cat is curled up in his clothes hamper, fast asleep. I didn't know he was in here, I just opened my closet door just now. We slowly turn to the stairs. Silence. Clearly, I grabbed my pillow and bunked on his floor that night. This sort of thing continued until we were almost desensitized to it. Things changed when we were getting ready to move out. My brother had moved to St. Louis. My parents had split up, and my father had moved out. It was just me and my mom taking care of the house and keeping it pretty for the realtors. I was out of the house most of the day and evening, at school and hanging out with friends and whatnot. One day mom said, it's not happy about all the changes, you know. Acting out. Having a tantrum, I expect. Who's not happy? I asked. You know. The house. And let me tell you, the dog isn't happy either. She was referring to her Jack Russell Terrier, who was, and is, her constant companion. I didn't inquire into the details. One weekend, dad came over, and we did an emergency search, box, and organize in the basement. One wall had sprung a leak and ruined some documents, so we went about moving everything over to the other wall. It took us all weekend and was backbreaking work, we had collected a lot of SHT over the years. Monday afternoon, it rained again. I returned home at the same time as my mom. It turns out that the dog had finally flipped out and was running to the basement door, screaming, and running back to her arms, shaking like a leaf. Finally, she put the dog in the car and went to McDonald's. I didn't think anything of it, self-absorbed 17-year-old, remember. Dad returned on Tuesday to pick up some things. We heard God damn it. And every other curse word coming from the basement stairs as he stormed up. Why did you move everything back to the other wall? The boxes are all wet now. He screamed at mom. I went down, and this is what I saw. Every box had indeed been moved to the other side of the basement and set on its side. That is, the boxes weren't lit up but stacked haphazardly against the wall with lids facing out. To this day, my father honestly believes, or chooses to believe, that my mom, with a muscular condition, undid in one day what took us two, just to irritate him. Conclusion, we were showing the house, and the basement door had to be kept closed. The cat's litter box was down there, so it had been open for the last six years. I was watching TV, and mom was outside brushing the dog, when someone started insistently knocking on a door. Well, it wasn't the front or back doors, because they were made of metal. It was a wooden door. I ran to the kitchen and looked dumbfounded. Mom mouthed, well, answer it. From the other side of the glass doors. I'm trying. I mouthed back. And then it hit me. As soon as I realized where the knocking was coming from, it stopped. I walked over to the basement door and opened it. We left it open from then on, unless there was a scheduled showing. We sold the house and never looked back. I married my college sweetheart right after we graduated. After about a year, it wasn't going well, and it seemed like it would be best for me to move out. My brother, who is a few years older than me, lived on the other side of town, where he has a fairly large house. He is actually planning to move to another city and stay there and rented accommodations pretty much all the time. He agreed that I can stay in the house until I get myself sorted out or until he sells the house, whichever comes first. His house was actually kind of run down. He had been planning to fix it up, but he was so busy with his job that he never really got that much done. I had plenty of time on my hands in the evenings and weekends, so I volunteered to do some fixing and decorating for him. Over a few months, I repainted all the rooms, fixed all the wooden floors, and even retiled both bathrooms, put in a new toilet and shower, etc. My brother paid for all the materials, he gave me a prepaid debit card, but I did all the labor for free, of course. The last room that I was doing was a bedroom. It had a built-in wardrobe cupboard, 
kind of built into the wall. I decided to paint the inside of the cupboard as well as the room itself, since the cupboard is dirty yellow inside with lots of black marks on the walls. I used the last of the white paint to paint the inside and left the doors open for it to dry. That was my Friday night, and then I went to bed. The next day was a Saturday, and the last thing to do was paint the walls of the room, which include a dark red lower half and a cream upper half, there's a rail between them, and it didn't look as horrible as it sounds. I went to get the red paint from the corridor, where I had been using it to touch up a spot that I had missed. I then went back to the corridor to get the red paint tray with the roller and brush in it. I tripped as I entered the room, the tray and roller fell on the floor, which fortunately was covered, but the brush went into the cupboard and hit the wall. It left a mark that looked like an elongated S with a long line going straight down underneath it. Now I was pissed because I would have to repaint the inside of the cupboard, at least a couple of coats to cover the dark red, which meant I would have to go out and buy more white paint as well. I picked up the brush and started to write shit, using the elongated S for the initial letter. The H, however, came out looking more like an A, so I wrote Satan instead. There was still a long line of paint running vertically under the S, so I made that into the vertical stroke of a K and wrote Kill. I thought nothing of it and then got on with painting the rest of the room. I spent several hours painting the entire room, and by the time I was finished, it was dark and late, and I was aching and really hungry. I decided to go downstairs to get some food and then go to sleep. As I was leaving the room, Satan Kill caught my eye, and for some reason I decided to write in orders you to after Satan, making the message Satan orders you to kill. It didn't seem important, as I am planning to paint over it anyway. The first thing Sunday morning, I went out and bought a tub of white paint. When I got back, I painted over Satan orders you to kill, but you can still read it through the white paint. I then started on the second coat in the room proper. When I finished their room, I redid the white roller over Satan orders you to kill in the cupboard again, but you can still read it. For the next week, every morning before I leave for work, and when I get back from working in the evening, I rollered another layer of white paint over Satan orders you to kill. I was convinced that it was still faintly visible. The next weekend, my brother came over, so I showed him the cupboard and asked him if he could see any message written inside it. He said that he couldn't. But I was still convinced that it was faintly visible. I told myself that it was my mind playing tricks on me and that I must take his word for it. Nevertheless, just to be sure, I did add a few more layers of paint over the next few days. During this time, there are occasionally people who come with a realtor to look at the house. My brother was, after all, trying to sell it. I do particularly remember one family, mother, father, and teenage boy, who spent ages looking over the house one Saturday. I think, not sure, if this is the same family that reappears later in this story. I soon moved out and moved away to another town. I got a new job and rented my own place. My brother eventually sold the house. I met a new girl, etc. At Christmas, my brother invited me and my girl over to his large apartment in a major city. We went to visit. When we are talking, he tells me that he is so glad that he is rid of that house, since it always gave him the creeps. She asks me if it ever gave me the creeps. It didn't. Then the killer revelation, the family who bought the house, the teenage son, killed his parents and hid their bodies in a cupboard. My grandmother told me this, and I believe it just because of the way she tells this story. She was 11 years old and on vacation at her aunt's house in Turkey, Yozgat, a small village called Sarikaya, which means yellow field. It was early in the morning. Before she woke up, she dreamed of her aunt and how she was standing in the kitchen and staring out of the window with a cup of coffee, like nearly every morning. In the dream, my grandmother says, good morning. Her aunt would turn to her, smile, and let her sit at the table, where they usually have breakfast, and say calmly, tell your mom to wake me up. Don't wake me up yourself, okay? And if you see a brown bird, follow the bird. She awoke from this odd dream and told her mom to wake up her sister. My grandmother had to leave her aunt's house the same day. After a long day at school, she was visiting a private school at this time, the kind where they give children uniforms. After the Ataturkian revolution, this was mandatory, she was on the way home when suddenly a chirping bird was in front of her. She tried to pass the bird, but it would just not leave my grandmother's path and soon would chirp louder. At this moment, she finally noticed that the bird had a brown color, and she remembered what her aunt was saying in the dream, follow the bird. The weird thing was, she said, that the bird wasn't flying at all. It was just jumping away from her, and she soon followed it till she reached the door of a police station, where an officer just opened the door and saw the little girl, which was my grandmother. The officer would soon look behind her to see a person with a black pouch, accompanied by some kind of farmer truck, waiting for this odd person. Needless to say, those persons have been kidnappers who decided to flee immediately. 
the officer decided to bring her home that day. Eventually, she found out that her aunt had died. Most likely on the day she left her house. This story is not as cool as some of the others, but I believe this actually happened. It takes place in the 1970s. My father's friend is a forest ranger who also happens to be a competitive pistol shooter. Like, who can hit the most targets the fastest. That sort of thing. He is driving with his wife, playing car poker with a local car club. Basically, the group comes up with objectives, generally places to drive to, and you are awarded a card for accomplishing them. The goal, of course, is to get the best hand. All of these objectives are completed over a weekend and are done individually. That is, the drivers go their own way. This is not a caravan. So, he and his wife are driving their convertible, I think it was a Triumph, along the back roads of Western Washington, near Concrete Washington. They come around a bend in the road, and a large pickup dragging a good-sized log comes tearing out, perpendicular to the road, so that the log is now blocking their path. Putting the car in reverse and looking behind him, the husband sees another truck do the same thing, effectively boxing him and his wife in. Each pickup bed is occupied by three to four rednecks. One of them has a shotgun. One of the rednecks, clearly the leader, jumps down from the bed and walks over to the car. It being a nice day, the windows are already down. The redneck leader leans into the car and leers at the man's wife. That is a fine looking woman you got there. The husband's pulse races. Being a competitive shooter and a forest ranger, technically a peace officer, the husband carries a pistol under the seat of his car. While the leader of the redneck bandits walked up to the car, the husband slowly reached under his seat, pulled up his revolver, and concealed it under his legs. As soon as he heard the leader imply that these men were going to rape his wife, he grabbed the leader by the collar and put the pistol to his forehead. You will have your guys move that log in front of us, or I will blow your fucking head off. The leader was silent for a moment. With the calculations running in his head, he said, you can't get all of us. Sure. But you will be dead. Self-preservation ruling the day for the leader, he motioned for the front log to be moved. The husband drove forward slowly, keeping hold of the leader's collar, until he was clear of the obstacle. He made it past and got the fuck out of there. I have several stories, and I couldn't decide which was the most unnerving. Some of these are for myself, and then some are for my family and friends. Although there are many more than this. 1. When I was about 10 years old, we lived in an old rental house while the house my parents currently live in was being built. One night I couldn't sleep, so I lay awake in bed. I heard some rustling going on in the dining room, and I assumed one of my parents was up doing something. So, I rolled over on my side and looked at the wall, only to see the form of someone squatting down by my bed, their head on the same level as mine. This person cocked their head when I made eye contact, although I could see no eyes, and I just stared back in disbelief. Although there was some light coming through my windows, no light seemed to hit him. He stood out against the light reflecting off of the wall, yet I could see no discernible features, just a black mass of a human. I rolled over the other way, utterly terrified to scream for fear of what he'd do. Needless to say, I never went back to sleep that night, and only in the light of the morning did I roll back over. Whatever it was, it had left my room without a sound. I coolly asked my parents the next morning if they'd been awake because I thought I'd heard something, and they said they both had slept through the night. 2. About 4 years after this incident, we had moved into the house that was being built. One night before bed, I was cleaning up a few things we'd left out while playing with friends in the yard, some bikes, my sister's electric Barbie Jeep, etc. I had gotten everything inside except for the basketball, so I went back for it. As I crossed the driveway, I threw the ball down as hard as I could to see how high I could bounce it, catch it, and repeat. As I approached the house, I bounced the ball one last time, and as my eyes followed it up, they stopped on something in front of me. Crouched on the gutter of my roof, about 10 feet in front of me, was the same, featureless form I'd seen several years prior. The basketball soared over my head and into the bushes. He immediately stood up, turned around, and walked up the steep slope of my garage roof as if it were nothing, then disappeared down the other side. I didn't make a sound. I never saw anything like him again, and I don't care to. 3. This story is similar to the previous one. My grandma is the oldest of seven kids, one of whom has since passed away from cancer. When they were young, before the youngest one or two were born, they all lived together with my great-grandparents in a house in Jeffrey, West Virginia. This house has many scary stories, and this is just one of those. Several of the kids found themselves being awakened at night by a noise on the roof. After this happened several nights in a row, they went downstairs to wake up their parents. 
they could never get them to wake up in time to hear the footsteps, as they would stop the second my great-grandparents awakened. So, my great-grandpa just thought the kids were being kids and told them not to bring it up again. One night later, the noise was incredibly loud, and so the kids were very scared. They ran downstairs and awakened their parents, this time who did hear the banging. So, my great-grandpa got his gun out and went outside. Naturally, he found nothing on the roof. The noises stopped after this and never came back. However, the next day, a neighbor came over and said, I just wanted to let you know that I saw something standing on your roof last night. 4. One of my best friend's grandpas is married to his second wife, whom no one likes for various reasons. Ultimately, she's a user who takes advantage of her husband. However, she's also quite crazy. She frequently wakes up in the middle of the night, screaming with awful dreams and visions. Although she claimed to have seen odd beings and creatures during the night, he never believed her. One night she awoke from a dream, then saw something standing in the corner of the room. She calmly awoke her husband and pointed into the corner, asking, believe me now? In the corner, he saw a dark robbed form with the body of a human but the head of an animal, an animal he has never been able to describe as anything other than utterly terrifying and otherworldly. He yelled, and it disappeared into a vapor. He has since split with his wife. This happened a couple of years ago. I was staying at my fiancé's place one night, and she has a six-year-old son whose room was right next to hers. I got up at about 1 a.m. to go take a leak. On my way back, I heard her son crying in his room. He has this stuffed cat from Build-A-Bear that he adores. It was his first ever Build-A-Bear that he got when he was two or three years old. Its name is Carmel, and it has one of the voice boxes that plays a meowing sound. So, I go into his room and ask him what's wrong, why is he crying? He said that one of the cats scratched Carmel as they were jumping off his bed and that he was hurt. I picked up his toy, looked it over, and saw nothing. I asked him where Carmel got hurt, and he indicated to one of the toy's paws. I gave it a kiss and said that it's all better now. He turned to me, tears in his eyes, and said that he wasn't and that Carmel was dead. I asked him why he would say that, and he responded that Carmel wasn't talking. I thought that he thought the voice box was somehow damaged or something, and I activated it, and after it's done meowing, I told him that everything was fine and that Carmel still talked. He looks up at me, and in a matter-of-fact voice, he says that is the voice box, not Carmel's voice. So, this is how my grandmother tells the story. It was 1933, and she was 13, living in the middle of Manchester, England. One night she got out of bed to go to the bathroom, and as she wandered through past the staircase, she saw her auntie standing at the top looking out the window. Curious, she trotted upstairs and stood next to see what she was looking at, but only saw the back garden and the alleyway out the back. She turned to ask her auntie what she was looking at, only to see a nebulous, faceless figure staring back down at her. The figure then reached out her hands and gripped my young grandmother's face. The next thing my grandmother remembers is her older brother, about 27, running down the hall towards them, picking her up, and carrying her into the nearest room. She then spent the next week in and out of consciousness, eventually recovering, but now without a sense of smell. Her family insists it was all a hallucination caused by a severe case of influenza, which is probably true, but my grandmother said she never felt safe in that house ever again. She moved to New Zealand about 10 years later and only ever returned to England, and that house, once before she died. I have an odd habit a friend recently picked up on, a habit I developed about a year ago. He noticed that when I enter a room, any room, and shut the door, I turn my face away from it and close my eyes until I hear the lock click. Only after the door is fully closed will I open them. He gave me a hard time about it until I told him where it started. I work for a water seal company in St. Paul. We produce sealant for exposed wood, decks, boats, that kind of thing. You hear about sealant being a dirty word in the Ashland Iker Falls Ironton area, but not all those companies were part of the infamous Ethelers summer that wiped out the local economy in the 50s. I got sent to an industrial park outside of Iker Falls on business. I checked into this dismal hotel, the Hotel Umbra, that looked like the decor hadn't been changed since 1930. The lobby wallpaper had gone yellow from decades of cigarette smoke, and everything had a fine layer of dust, including the old man behind the front desk. I hoped that the room would be in better shape. Mine was on the fourth floor. Being an old place, the hotel had a rickety cable elevator, the kind with the double sets of doors, one of those flexing metal gates, and a solid outer pair of doors. I shut the gate, latched it, and pressed the tiny black button for my floor. Just as the outer elevator doors were about to close, I was startled by the face of a young woman rushing at the gap between them. She was too late, the doors shut, and after a moment, the elevator ascended. 
I thought nothing of it until I needed to take the elevator back down for one of my bags. I entered, pushed the button for the lobby, and pressed my tired back to the elevator wall opposite the doors. They had nearly completely shut when, again, I was surprised by a woman's face moving towards the gap, staring into the elevator through the gate, too late to place her hand in to stop the doors from closing. This time I sprang forward and held the door open button, and after a moment, the doors lurched and slid open. I waited a moment. From the opening, I could see partly down the hallway, no one in sight. Still holding the button down, I slid open the metal gate and craned my head into the hallway to look in the other direction. No one. No trace of the girl, no recently shut hotel room door, no footsteps, no jingle of keys. I released the button, but I did not lean back against the wall. I stood directly in front of where the gap in the doors would be, in the center of the elevator. After a pause, the outer doors again began to slide shut and move towards each other until the space between them was the width of a young girl's face. In that quarter second, several fingertips appeared, followed immediately by her face again, rushing from around the corner, staring at me as the doors met. I had been watching the gap where I thought she might be, so I saw her, she was about 13 years old and very plain, almost homely, with a pale complexion and neck-length dark brown hair that looked must or slightly dirty. I didn't have time to glance down at her visible shoulder to see what she was wearing, from her behavior, I wondered if she was a runaway or a homeless person who had gotten into the building. She had had a glassy, blank expression, tinged with a little desperation, some distant desire or need. A look that could easily be accompanied by the words please help. The next time I passed the front desk, I asked the old man if he'd seen a young girl running through. Hear the stories, then, he said between throat clearings, rocking gently in his seat. Young Maddie has been here a long time. Takes a liking to gentlemanly guests. Always been shy. Never say a word, not a word. Just curious. I told him I hadn't heard any stories and that there had been a girl taking the stairs and standing in front of my elevator on every floor. That's our daddy, he said. She likes you then. Sweet on you. She just wants to see, that's all. All she ever does. Curious little thing. Just wants to see. I stayed at the Hotel Umbra for three nights. It was a four-night business trip, the last night I tried sleeping in my car. It didn't help. Let me tell you about young Maddie. You only catch glimpses of her, of a face with a resigned look of quiet desperation, dominated by a pair of wide, dark eyes. Locked doors, barricades, nothing made a difference, she got inside. I never saw her for more than half a second. Every time I laid eyes on her, she retreated instantly, only to appear again an hour or two later. An hour or two, if I was lucky. Let me tell you about where I saw young Maddie. Every time I shut the door to my bathroom and my hotel room, I saw her. If I watched as I shut it, at the last possible second, I'd see the crescent of her face moving fast at the gap. I'd throw the door open to find nothing. Every time I closed the closet door, I saw her. If I watched that gap, she'd suddenly be inside the closet, leaning her head to watch me just as it shut. It's as if she knew where to go and where to be so that my eye would meet hers. But there was never an impact, never a moment when she'd make contact with the door or the wall. The first time I sat at that writing table, I saw her. I closed the large bottom drawer. She rushed at the gap from inside the drawer, her wide eyes pleading for something I could not give. I pulled the drawer from its rails and threw it to the floor. I did spend that last night in my car, but like I said, it did no good. Tossing and turning on that rental car seat, the back ratcheted as flat as I could get it. I'd have to open my eyes sometimes, and if there was a place for her to dart from my view when I opened them, she did. In the side view mirror, or peeking over the hood of my car, once upside down, at the top of the windshield, as if she were on the roof. I'm back in St. Paul again, and I've been back for a year. But Maddie hasn't stopped. If I keep my eyes open long enough, if I watch a place long enough, I'll eventually catch sight of movement, near the copier in my office, a pile of boxes in an alley, a column in a quiet parking lot, and my eye will get there just in time to see her eye retreating from view. There's never anything there when I go to look, so I've stopped looking. That's how I've had to change things since the Hotel Umbra. I've stopped looking. I keep my eyes shut when I close doors, when I shut drawers and cabinets, fridges, coolers, and the trunk of my car. Not all spaces. Just ones that are big enough. At least, that used to work. I was getting ready for bed a few nights ago, standing in front of my bathroom mirror, door shut, cabinets shut. Watching myself floss. I opened up wide to get my molars. I swear I saw my fingertips retreat down the back of my throat. I was super excited to get my first apartment. It was in an old antebellum house that was split into four units. 
it is a very cool place to live. However, every time I was taking a shower, I would get this overwhelmingly creepy feeling. It seemed like somebody was watching me. Then the dream started. I kept dreaming about this old lady in a pink nightgown. Sometimes she just looked frail and sweet, and she'd say that I should go with her. She never said where we'd go. Other times, the dreams were terrifying. Her eye sockets were empty. Her hair was greasy, stringy, and falling out. Her mouth was twisted in a tormented scream. And she'd frantically claw the air, trying to grab me. The longer I lived there, the more menacing the dreams got. Also, the feeling of unease and the feeling of being watched in the shower increased dramatically. By the time we moved out, I couldn't close my eyes in the shower. It sounds silly, but I had this overwhelming feeling that I was going to die or lose my soul or something if I had my eyes closed too long. After moving out, I discussed all these weird feelings with a friend of mine who had recently moved into a house across the street from the old apartment. I was trying to laugh it off. He said that another friend of his used to live in the apartment above mine several years ago. An old lady died in what used to be my apartment. Nobody else wanted to live in that unit for more than a couple of months at a time. The building recently burned down. The fire started in my old apartment. They still don't know what started the fire. It still creeps me out. When I was in my first year of college, I dated a guy in my hometown, about 45 minutes away from my school. He lived with his dad and dog, and I would often stay at his house over the weekends. This guy had already shared some pretty strange stories with me, some that we could attribute to his sleep paralysis, but I was somewhat skeptical of anything being truly paranormal. I'll share a few of my stories here. One night, we both woke up to noises downstairs. It had sounded like someone was coming in through the squeaky back screen door. The dog was going mad, barking at the closed bedroom door. My boyfriend grabbed a gun he kept by the bed and went downstairs to investigate. We seriously thought someone was breaking in, and we could hear them walking downstairs. After a few minutes, he came back upstairs and said no one was there, and the back door was closed. We both went to check things out a little further, and there was no sign of an attempted break-in, and the doors were all locked. The next day, we asked his dad if he had been up in the middle of the night, and he hadn't, nor had he heard anything. On another occasion, we both woke up again, but to something else. It felt like we were in an earthquake. Or what I imagine an earthquake to feel like. I don't know, because we live in Kansas. The dog was once again barking and growling at the door. My boyfriend and I look at each other, totally petrified and still feeling shaking and tremors, fully awake. We look at the door, and there's a green light coming under the door. It looked as if the hall light was replaced with a dim green party light. I can't remember if he got up to investigate or not, but I'm sure I just hid under the covers. The next morning, the hall light had a normal bulb, and we asked his dad if he had experienced anything strange or felt an earthquake, and he said he hadn't. I know there are fault lines in the area, and it's not totally impossible to experience an earthquake around here, but there were no reports in the news about a quake. I'm pretty sure the shaking wasn't caused by a truck going by because his house wasn't near any main roads where big trucks would travel. Later, he moved into a duplex with a roommate. I had gone to his place for a visit and rang the doorbell. His roommate came to the door and peeked out the curtain. I could see he was holding a kitchen knife. He just stared at me, like he didn't recognize me. He finally opened the door. I hesitated to come in, and he continued to look at me, holding the knife. He lowered it, turned, and went to his room upstairs. I went into my boyfriend's room and asked him what was up with the roommate. My boyfriend said that the doorbell has been ringing on its own, over and over. Whenever they go to answer it, no one is there. There are so many other little things that happen while I dated this guy, and we've kept in touch. I wouldn't believe them if I hadn't experienced things myself. He still experiences things, and we think he somehow brings them on because they seem to follow him wherever he lives. Maybe it has to do with his heritage or something his father experienced when he was young. His dad told me this story, he and his buddies decided to go to a very notoriously haunted cemetery in the area. They dared him to enter the old church or house and walk down the basement stairs. My boyfriend's dad said that he descended the stairs into complete darkness, and it smelled horrible. He then heard his dead grandmother call him by his family nickname and tell him to turn around and leave. My story is true, and I still don't have an explanation for it to this day. My grandmother used to live in an old house from the early 20s that was pretty run down when she and my grandfather bought it two years before I was born. My grandfather poured his heart and soul into fixing the house, but before he could finish it, he died of lung cancer, I was two at the time and barely knew him. The renovations were never completed, and my grandmother lived there alone. I pretty much spent most of my childhood in the house with my grandmother, and most of my earliest memories of the house were all of some sort of presence being there. 
I remember finding buttons left in patterns on the floor all over the house, hearing opera music and Phantom of the Opera playing whenever I was left alone, and repeatedly seeing my toys rearranged in my playroom. I was not a kid who believed in ghosts at all, and I never felt scared enough of their presence to tell anyone about it. It felt comforting and friendly. When I was 12, my grandmother decided to sell the house because she couldn't keep up with caring for it anymore. I was pretty devastated, as I could not deal with the fact that this house I loved so much would be out of my life forever. The last time I was there, I was in my playroom alone. All the furniture was gone, and everyone was outside loading the moving van. I was listening to Phantom of the Opera on my tape player and was sitting there thinking about how I would one day find a way to get the house back. Suddenly, the tape skipped and sped forward to the last song on the musical, where the Phantom sings, You alone can make my song take flight, it's over now, the music of the night. It was really creepy, and I remember just staring at the tape player, but I brushed it off. But, right after the tape stopped, I heard a bell ringing far off in the house. I was curious and tried to follow the sound of it. I eventually ended up in the basement, and the sound grew very loud and stopped. Something told me to look down, and I saw a gold bracelet on the ground. It had a little bell on it that, when I picked it up, made the exact same sound as the bell I was hearing before. It made me so scared that I nearly ran out of the house, but right before I did, I stopped and looked back and saw the unclear reflection of a man in the glass doors to the living room. I figured my dad was playing a trick on me at this point, but when I finally did leave the house, I found out he hadn't been on the property for hours. I also, several years later, found out that my grandfather used to play Phantom of the Opera music through the house, used to collect buttons, and had a gold bell bracelet that once belonged to his mother that he had lost in the basement when he and my grandmother first moved in. It was incredibly creepy to find these things out. And to this day, every time I am near the house, I can hear the Phantom of the Opera playing faintly in the background. I am still not ready to believe in ghosts, but there are just too many coincidences here for a rational explanation to be given. I just hope I am not completely crazy or something. There is a known phenomenon whose name has escaped my Google Foo powers. You hear your name called in a bustle of sound, organized or random. Sometimes in silence, sometimes near the edge of sleep. I didn't know this phenomenon was something measurable and tangible until recently. My parents had gotten high-speed internet for the first time, they hate technology, and my sister was too young to use anything but a speak and spell. The internet was for me, my parents always gave me everything, and here finally was the whole word, or at least GeoCities. For Christmas, I got a CD player, not a Walkman, we were too poor to afford name brands. About the same time, I discovered downloading music and scraped enough money together to buy my first CD burner, 8X. At last I could take music with me on my walkabouts or when delivering flyers, my first job. At the time, I tended to listen to orchestral music, sometimes symphonies, but more often film scores. I would always be downloading more music and burning it on new, cheap CDs. I would never have any money since I was always buying new blank CDs. And once a week, in blustery cold or blistering heat, I would go deliver flyers to support my habit. It was almost like meditation, listening to the pop classical of the time. You didn't pay attention to how weary your limbs were or the effect of the extremities on your skin. But one thing always snapped me out of my trance. Hearing my name called suddenly amidst a swelling of strings, or in the applause after a performance, I would whirl around, pausing the music, to see who was calling my name. I was only ever greeted by empty air. This went on for months into the summer, intermittently enough that it would fool me every time. I went through CDs quickly, so I could not anticipate when in the song this would happen, and it seemed to happen with greater frequency. I thought I was crazy, but I dared tell no one that music literally spoke to me. And the most recent CD was the worst, at least four times over the course of an hour, it called me. When I got home from delivering shoddy deals to people's doors one day, I was particularly exhausted. My mom was there to greet me, as was my sister. They were washing the car. Mom saw how exhausted I was and offered me some iced tea. I gladly accepted and flopped down on a hammock strung in our yard. Mom went inside to make the tea. I closed my eyes and turned the volume up, and there, in meditation, I stayed for many minutes until I heard my name being called. But for once, I found strength of will and closed my eyes tighter, though my muscles still jumped when I heard my name. And then it happened again. Twice in the same song, then a third time, fourth, fifth, almost in time with the melody. I relented, and I opened my eyes. My six-year-old sister was splayed face down on the street. I rushed over to her, ripping my headphones off and letting them fall. The car that hit her had long sped away, but she was. The car didn't just hit her. It ran over her. 
It crushed her hip bones and her legs and dragged her away so her face was cut up by the asphalt. Her nose was broken. She was pulling herself off the road with only her arms. And she was calling my name, and she was calling my mother's name, and she was screaming and weeping. And I didn't know what to do, so I stayed with her. She died on the way to the hospital. My parents blame me. I blame me, I was supposed to watch her. Years later, my music collection is measured in discographies, songs I have never listened to and will never listen to inhabit my hard drive. I still have old CDs in drawers and in random places around the house, and one winter evening I found the disc I was listening to the day my sister died. I put it on my computer, closed my eyes, and turned up the volume. I resist the urge to skip the song, which now only conjures images of her on the road, and listen. My heart beats quickly, but the movement finishes and the symphony continues. In the middle of the second to last piece, there is a rest before the finale. And in the silence, I heard three clear words. Let me die. When I listen to the song again, the words are no longer there. But I did hear them. I'm not crazy. When I was young, anything that had to do with archaeology began to thrill me. My mom would take me to the library to do whatever little research projects a teacher gives a nine-year-old, or to finish my homework, and I would sneak old issues of National Geographic into my books or under my work. When she wasn't looking, I would go back to reading the articles about dead civilizations, the work being done to excavate their tombs and cities, and their superstitions and religions. So when my birthday rolled around the next year and my parents asked me what I wanted, I proudly named off several books about archaeology. And, a few days later, I was given my birthday present, three big and heavy books about ancient societies that lived in North and South America and the Caribbean. It wasn't exactly what I had been expecting. I thought that I had explicitly asked for books about ancient Greece and Egypt. Regardless, this was something new and exciting, and the books were all about these people and the excavations that had occurred for each respective society. Being that I was only about 10 years old at the time, I was, and still am, actually, a huge fan of breasts. In one of the books, there was an image of a dark figurine that had been carved, presumably, from some dark stone. It was an onyx, and I can't remember what the stone actually was at this point. But it was a figurine of a pregnant woman with enormous breasts, so I liked the picture. It was missing its head, though. On the adjacent page was an image of a pregnant tribeswoman. The book made the conjecture that the figurine was an ancient image or icon of a pregnant tribeswoman. I kept looking back and forth between the two pictures. The figurine was missing its head. It began to unsettle me, and, eventually, I became so freaked out by the juxtaposition of the images that, during future read-throughs, I would skip these pages entirely. As I grew older, my interest in archaeology diminished quite a bit. My archaeology books ended up in a donation box for the local library, and I moved on to other interests, namely fantasy, sci-fi, role-playing games, etc. Several years down the road, my parents and I went to a bed and breakfast that was owned by friends of my mother. It's an old estate that is next to a main road. There is the main house, where the bed and breakfast is operated, a carriage house, and about 50 yards away, another smaller house, which is where the owners, my mother's friends, live. The estate is on an enormous old plot of land and, despite being next to the main road, is surrounded by apple orchards. My parents took me up there for my 16th birthday. Just what every 16-year-old boy wants, right? They were going to let me drive up and back, though, since I had just gotten my license, so I acquiesced and went with them. The place was amazing. It was enormous, there were stories of ghost sightings, all sorts of history surrounded the area, the houses on the property were all around 150 years old, and the orchards were awesome. The staff at the B&B &B was really cool. Everybody was very laid back. One of the cooks was serene, a thin black woman, she was very pretty but distracted, flighty, and she had this really thick island accent. Regardless, she was very entertaining, and she had an awesome laugh. When we were all hanging out at night, she would often turn her eyes toward the orchard and kind of get lost in her thoughts. We stayed there for a little more than a week. After the first few days, I had grown somewhat bored. I asked my mother's friend if it would be okay if I took a stroll through the orchard. Sure, she said. Explore as much as you'd like, but get back here before sunset, there are coyotes in the area. Awesome. That childish urge to explore had woken up since I was immersed in a place that had some actual history. Something inside of me really wanted to find an old Civil War bullet or an arrowhead, anything really, out in the orchard. The first day I was out there was really uneventful. In fact, it grew old quickly. The property was immense, and I had explored for about two hours, and all I could see was a tree line somewhere in the distance. 
and my mom's friend wasn't kidding about the coyotes, I saw prints in some of the areas where the soil was softer. There was one spot where it looked as if a couple of them had bedded down for the night. There was a swath of terrain in between two apple trees that had been tamped down. The soil in the middle was actually devoid of any grass or anything else. At first, I thought this was strange, but then I found a giant apple on a limb, plucked it, and ate it. On my way back to the house, I got a little lost, but I happened to see Serene in the distance. She saw me and smiled, and I caught up to her. She was humming what sounded like a lullaby. I asked her about it, and she told me that it was an island song that people in the Caribbean sang in order to calm noisy or upset spirits. We chatted a bit, and she told me that she had been working there for about eight months. She said that the first two and a half months had been atrocious. When pressed, she became a bit distant again and said that the spirits of the area were very restless. I asked her how she knew and why she was so concerned. She smiled broadly and said that all of the women in her family had a deep connection with the spirits. She said that, soon after her arrival, she began seeing many of them. And they began seeing her. They began to take quite an interest in her and would bother her incessantly, particularly during the night. Old men and women, she said, couldn't find their way. They get angry. Very angry. And this island song quiets them and soothes their anger. Being an inquisitive and somewhat amused teenager, I asked, are there any spirits with us right now? She nodded her head, and her smile disappeared somewhat. How many? I inquired. She stopped in her tracks, all remnants of that smile disappeared, and she said, boy, if I were to tell you the answer to that, you would pack your things and go. As we started walking again, I told her about the area that I had found where the grass was tamped down and talked to her about coyotes. She had a suspicious look on her face but only said, I don't think you should go back there, friend. The orchard is big, and there are many curious things in it. We got back to the B&B &B right as the sun started to dip. The next day, we went into town and did a bunch of touristy things that my parents wanted to do. I tagged along. It was kind of fun, but I kept thinking about the orchard. In particular, that one spot in the orchard. We got back after dark, and, just as my mom's friend had said, we could hear coyotes howl. It rained that night. The next day, I asked if I could head into the orchard again. My parents said that it was fine, and so did their friends. I headed out in the afternoon, giving the soil a chance to dry some. I took a backpack with me and snuck a couple of beers into it. I also packed a sandwich. I was planning on exploring as much as I could. I went into the orchard and started making my way through the trees, roughly following the path that I had before. I walked for a couple of hours in one direction and, eventually, got to some sort of property line. It was marked by an old stone wall, the type you see in Civil War flicks. That part of the orchard ended there, and a thick forest started about 100 feet beyond. I was pretty excited and followed the wall for some time. I dug through some piles of crumbled stone, hoping to find a bullet. No good. I did manage to find some arrowheads, though. I stashed them in my bag. I stopped along the wall, ate my sandwich, and drank one of the stolen beers. Right before I finished, I heard a crash in the woods. I stuffed the sandwich into my mouth, chugged the beer, and put the trash in my bag. The minute I finished, I glanced over toward the forest, and three coyotes emerged. I dove behind the wall, hoping that they hadn't seen me. I poked my head up, and, sure enough, they hadn't noticed me. They started moving, languidly, away from me and traveling along the wall. Occasionally, they would stop when they heard something, and I would duck behind the wall again. Soon enough, the wall actually ended, and I was exposed. The minute I had nothing to hide behind, they took notice of me. All three of them, in perfect unison, turned and looked right at me. We stared at each other for a few seconds, and then they went about their business, and I started heading back into the orchard. On my way back through, I got a little lost again and wandered around, occasionally checking the ground for Civil War bullets or old cans, anything to make my explorations feel a bit more fruitful. Eventually, I came across the area that I had noticed a few days ago. The vegetation was still somewhat tamped down, and the spot in the middle was bare. Something didn't look right, though. I approached the spot and looked at the ground. The way that the grass had been pressed down looked strange. It wasn't evenly flattened, as if a coyote had laid upon it. It was really uneven in parts, it almost looked as if boots or feet had stomped it down. Something caught my eye. There was something dark and smooth protruding from the center where there was no growth. I thought I had hit the jackpot. I figured this was going to be part of an old rifle, a cannonball, or something great. I grabbed hold of whatever this thing was and gave it a tug. The ground, still damp, gave way, and I pulled it free rather easily. It was covered in mud, but when I cleared the damp earth from it, 
It looked like a figurine of some sort. It was shaped oddly and, from what I could tell, looked something like a fat man or woman. But it was missing its head. Then I remembered the images from my archaeology book. I also remembered the angry spirits. I started to get a little freaked out, so I tossed the figure into my backpack and started moving. I tried to hum the tune that Serene had taught me two days prior, but I couldn't remember it properly. Then I heard something in the orchard. It sounded as if somebody was walking, ever so lightly, upon the ground. It would stop when I stopped. It would start when I started. At one point, about 10 minutes away from the B&B, I stopped, dropped to the ground, and looked around the orchard. In the distance, about 25 yards away, the three coyotes watched me intently. They had lowered their heads and were staring at me. When I stood up and began walking again, they started tracking me again. I walked very, very slowly. They walked very, very slowly. I picked up my pace. They picked up my pace. And then I heard humming. The coyotes picked up their ears. I saw Serene in the distance, coming my way. Relieved, I began walking toward her. The coyotes still followed. She saw me coming toward her and smiled. I pointed to the coyotes, and she paused and then laughed. It's okay, boy. They're just interested in you. I sighed. I approached her, and she started walking with me. I found the wall today. I told her. Did you now? She looked disinterested. Did you go over it? Into the forest? No. But that's where I first saw the coyotes. And you followed them, didn't you? She smiled. Yeah. How did you know? They told me, she smiled, that you followed them because you were curious like their brother Wolf. And then they were curious about you, so they started following. They also smelled your sandwich. They wouldn't hurt you, though. We walked for a few more minutes, still being followed by the coyotes. I was beginning to suspect that she had been feeding them over the course of her employment at the B&B. Oh, I stopped and dug into my bag to retrieve the figurine. I found this in the orchard. I guess it had been buried, but the rain unearthed it some. It was at the center of that area that I found it the other day. You know where the grass was pressed down? Although I don't think it was the coyotes anymore. I grabbed the figure and brought it out of my bag. It looked more like some other animal, or maybe people tamped the grass down. She took one look at the figure and blanched. Shakily, she pulled the figurine from my hands. What have you done, boy? My heart sank. I thought she would have been as excited as I was. She clenched the figure, and it shook a bit due to her anger. Her eyes widened, and she cried to me in a hideous, almost guttural tone of voice, What have you done? I saw something like it in an old book of mine once. I thought it was interesting. I don't know what. I tried to justify my actions, but before I could explain further, she ran into the orchard. I looked over and saw the coyotes watching her run off. So I ran after her. I shouted her name. I shouted that I was sorry. She made it to the circle before I did, dropped to her knees, and started digging up the ground in the middle. She was crying, trying to hum the island tune. The coyote stopped and watched as I got on my knees and dug as well. When we had a large enough hole for the figurine, I picked it up, placed it in the hole right side up, and began putting earth back on top of it. No, 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 Serene cried. She pulled the figure back up, turned it upside down, and put it back on the ground. Like that. She muttered. She fell back to her rear, hummed, and cried. When I was done covering the figurine up, I looked around, the coyotes were nowhere to be seen. Serene was still crying, humming that island tune. I searched for the right words of apology, but there were none. She scooted over, got closer to me, and put her arms around me. I began humming with her. Her tears became fierce, and her sobs forced her to stop humming. I stopped as well. That's when we heard it. It started as a sharp, keen, faraway place by the main road. The keen became the sound of tires wrestling with the pavement, trying desperately to keep hold. And then there was the sudden, sickening silence of the friction between the tires and the pavement being broken. And it was followed by a heart-wrenching, solid crash. There were no sounds of something being dragged across asphalt or sounds of car parts shattering and skittering across the road like insects. Just a vomit-inducing crunch. Serene stopped crying and was silent. She stood up and began to run back to the B&B. I followed. By the time we were at the edge of the orchard, close enough to see the guests at the B&B, my parents and their friends included, standing in groups on the grounds, we heard the sirens and saw the smoke. The car had somehow left the road and hit a tree across the street from the B&B. Serene immediately went to be with a group of people that worked at the B&B. She put her arms around a large white guy, and he held her as she wept more. I found my parents as the ambulances showed up. 
The fire truck actually pulled into the driveway at the B&B. Everybody was anxious to know if the driver was okay, if there had been passengers, and, if there were, if they were okay. My parents' friends went and spoke with several of the firemen and EMTs. When they returned, they urged everybody to return inside. The EMTs had informed them that it was rather gruesome, and none of us should be around to witness them extract the body from the vehicle. I didn't see Serene again that night. The EMTs and the firefighters worked for several hours. I was watching from the bar when they moved a large black bag on a gurney from the crash to the ambulance. The bag had a very distinct profile, you could make it out even under the material. I told my parents my story about the coyotes, and they let me off the hook for taking the beers. In fact, they let me have the last one out of my pack because they thought that I was frightened by the accident. When the ambulances began to leave without lights and sirens, my parents' friends went outside to talk to the few remaining firefighters. The large white man came out of the kitchen and entered the bar as I stood by the window and watched. He approached me inside, terrible thing, isn't it? I looked up at him. Yeah. I wonder what happened. He grimaced and said to me, there are many bad things in the orchard. He nodded at me and continued, you understand that Serene's upset, right? You know why? I shook my head. The spirits will be very angry now. Very angry. I nodded. Tell her I'm sorry. He considered it and before turning to leave, he replied, the orchard is big, and there are many curious things in it. But curious boys don't belong there. He left the room as my mom's friends returned. That's a horrible thing to hear, said Scott. Tragic. His wife, the other owner, replied. My parents stared for a moment. The fire truck had left. What happened? My dad asked. A pregnant woman was beheaded and died in the crash, I said it from the window. They turned to look at me. How did you know? asked my mother's friend.